for those of you who don't know me, I'm Justin Wang, advocacy manager at Greenbelt Alliance. So first of all, thank you to everyone for attending our webinar today. In case this is your first time joining us, Greenbelt Alliance is a nonprofit organization based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate in order to make the Bay Area's lands and communities more resilient to a changing climate. So joining, to me, joining me today are three incredible people. First is Michael Anderson, senior researcher for Sightline Institute. Michael Anderson covers housing and transportation issues as a senior researcher for Sightline Institute, the Pacific Northwest sustainability think tank. He previously spent 10 years covering these issues as a journalist in Washington and Oregon. We are also joined by Tamara White, managing director for Small Housing BC. Tamara is a planner and housing specialist with a background in community-based development. She has conducted extensive international research and policy analysis and has held strategic roles embedded within government housing and planning agencies. Her current work focuses on aligning governments, nonprofits, developers, and investors to scale up and enhance the impact of the community housing sector. As managing director of Small Housing BC, she establishes municipal partnerships, coordinates technical support for info initiatives, and leads advocacy efforts with the provincial government, championing the inclusion of smaller housing forms in established single family neighborhoods. And last but certainly not least, we have Robert Slade, Director of Sales and Marketing for Small Works. Robert has been working with Small Works since 2013. He is, affection is affectionately known as an ADU midwife amongst his clientele in recognition of the sometimes arduous process involved in bringing these babies into the backyard. He has guided over 200 families through the laneway house design build process. From a 300 square foot Wabi Sabi tea house to a 1300 square foot multi-generational East Vancouver infill, each project has had unique obstacles that Robert has helped the design team, construction team and client to overcome. So we're here today to discuss, discuss something, of a hot, something of a hot topic at the moment, opportunity housing or uh, San Jose's unique name for allowing duplexes, triplexes and fourplexes across the city's neighborhoods. Recently, we've seen cities like Berkeley and Sacramento move forward with similar proposals. In San Jose, the city's general plan four-year review task force made up of stakeholders and community leaders from every council district recommended that the city develop a policy to allow opportunity housing in neighborhoods currently restricted to single family homes in neighborhoods across the city. With this recommendation, the next decision point for our city is whether or not the city council will direct staff to continue studying how this policy would affect San Jose. In particular, uh, the community outreach, we've seen lots of questions about how this will affect our city, particularly around the environmental and sustainability impacts. And so in order to answer these questions, we searched far and wide for the world's renowned experts, and we've come to you with this panel. So we're going to kick things off by me passing, passing the torch over to Michael, who will uh, do a quick presentation. And we'll all do, we'll do so just to give uh, some context on, on the format of this, we'll be opening up with presentations from each of our panelists, and then we'll have some time for Q&A from our audience at the end. So to kick us off is going to be Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thanks so much, Justin. I'm going to share with everybody. Uh, so uh, like Justin said, I'm based up in Portland, and I'm just going to share some data points that I found persuasive about this question of uh, sort of the, with the environmental benefits of letting people live near each other if they want to, which is basically what we're talking about. Uh, let me start with the, the just the basic uh, insight of all of this work is that cities save energy. This is the Bay Area, of course, and you can see the bluer zip codes here are the those with the lowest carbon consumption per person, and the red are the higher carbon consumption per person. This is also the same pattern you see in the Seattle metro area, uh, the Portland metro area, and in the abstract. This is what a study of this looks like across various cities and metro areas. And you can see that on the right, you have a column of uh, higher density neighborhoods have significantly lower uh, construction operation energy output than the uh, lower density neighborhoods. And you can see I'll break this up into a couple different parts. I'll talk about each of these in turn. So the transportation block uh, is one, and then I'll talk about the building operations and construction second. So to focus on the transportation side, I think it's pretty intuitive when people are allowed to live near each other and then they more of them do choose to live near each other, that reduces the cost of getting around because you don't have as far to go. But one thing I wanna highlight from this study from this year, 
actually 20 came out just came out a couple of months ago in particular is that uh, I think the transit is not as important as we may think sometimes to reducing driving. It's not that it's unimportant. It's fantastic as a way to reduce driving, but you don't need the transit to precede everything else in order to reduce the driving. What this study found uh, was based on a ran randomized controlled study of sort of middle income households uh, was that the, uh, the walk score as a measure of how many variety of different services are within walking distance and the supply of parking are more powerful predictors of reduced transit use or more powerful correlates to reduce transit use than transit quality itself. Uh, that's not to say it's not important, but we can move forward on all of those step by step on each frame and still make progress against the overpopulation of cars. This is a study that came out a few years ago by the Department of Environmental Quality of Oregon that goes to those other part of the bar chart I showed, the waste and material use involved in the residential construction and operation industry. And by the way, if this is a study that you would like to see summarized or just know about the existence of, you can sign up for our alerts about this stuff as it relates to housing policy on our website. That's my plug for Sightline. Uh, but the finding of this study was that uh, basically by a huge scale of measures, smaller homes are more environmentally friendly. They're, they are less likely to cause cancer among many other factors. But I'm interested uh, specifically here in the impacts on climate. And if you drill down specifically on that issue, what you find uh, is that the smaller and attached homes, that's on the leftward bar, have significantly less energy consumption over the course of, I think they used a 70 year projected lifespan than bigger homes. And if homes are have a longer lifespan, then that's more years at which those homes are heated and cooled and the size of the homes and the, whether they're not they're attached matters more and more and more. So the, uh, the energy cost of heating and cooling a structure basically dwarf the energy cost of building and demolishing it if you assume a lifespan of more than 20 years or so. This is a similar study uh, actually based on the English housing stock, but it shows the same general trend. Larger homes and older homes have much more energy usage. Pretty intuitive, but this is a very robust data set that found that in various contexts. Uh, so to think about all these things, I did a thought experiment a few years ago here in Oregon when we were having a conversation about fourplex legalization. Uh, I imagined, what if you had a block of like, I think it's 20 homes or 18 homes I used. Uh, and uh, we imagine that three of those properties redevelop as giant one unit homes, for example, because that's the only thing you're legally allowed to build on that lot is a one unit structure that the, sort of a rich neighborhood will naturally tend towards larger and fancier one unit homes like these. What if you get three lots developed like this or in an alternate future, we legalize plexes and you get one lot becomes a duplex, one lot becomes a triplex, and one lot becomes a fourplex, and the other lots all stay the same. What would that add up to? What it comes out to is about a 20% carbon savings on average for the entire block because of those additional homes, the smaller and attached homes, which may have a structure that's actually the same size, but have smaller and attached homes inside that structure on the plex block compared to the McMansion block where energy use uh, is significantly higher in that future scenario. Uh, so the conclusion of this for me anyway, is that a healthy mix of housing types, which is great for many ways, is also great for reducing our climate emissions. And the, one of the greatest things about it is it's voluntary. As my uh, friend Peyton puts it, the, uh, I, I love this insight that it's unlike all the other things we're trying to do on the climate. This is something we're just trying to let people do what they want. They want to spend their own money to voluntarily reduce their own climate emissions. We just need to make sure that local zoning lets them do that. This is a visualization I love of what that might ha look like in the California context. It's by Alfred Twu up in Berkeley and uh, sort of a, a look at like scattering these uh, different options through a neighborhood can have a huge impact on the number of homes and also on the carbon emissions without a ton of transformation to a city. That's all I've got to say. I'll pass it on. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for that, Michael. That was super insightful. And I think next we'll go right over to Robbie. Hello, everyone. Um, that was that was really insightful, Michael. Thank you. I have nothing nearly as useful as that to show. 
But uh, what I can speak to is my experience in, in developing this type of housing and, and the change that I've been able to see in, in neighborhoods in Vancouver, which has been like really quite interesting. Um, what, what we do at Smallworks is we, we build these smaller footprint homes that are uh, beside the main house. So this is like a, a recent example of something that we've you know, just completed. And they look, every single one of them looks, um, looks quite different from, from the last. I mean, one thing that we're noticing is, is when I first met my boss, Jake, about, uh, God, 10 years ago now, the, the idea that we had is that we were going to take set floor plans and just kind of plop them down in different backyards. Um, but understanding now, all this time later, how contextual architecture is um, and, and the difficulty in actually reusing plans with the challenges that exist on every site. We found that it's, it's almost easier to, to custom design every single home. Um, sorry about the carbon footprint of this wood fire place. It is the first one we've ever done. But here you can see the laneway house in relationship to the main house. So opportunities for architectural departure um, and it's just, we end up with these great little starter homes. Um, in speaking of like what it's like to live in close proximity to one another, this is actually my house um, that's on our website. Um, we live in like a, a 760 square foot, one level home. Um, so it's a two bedroom with my wife and daughter and I live here. And if we were to take something like that, because there's there's three units on this property, we've got a main house with a basement suite and then the laneway house. But if we were to even take like a very small lot in Vancouver, this is a project that we're working on right now. This is like a teeny tiny 490 square foot cottage that we're building for um, like this kind of hip single dude who's going to live in here. It's a a one bedroom, I can show you the floor plan. But um, what he's gonna have in terms of living space is it's really something that we, a term that we use again and again at Smallworks, which is the concept of just enough. So enough space for him to live and work and entertain a little bit and don't tell the city of Vancouver but we're actually even going to put in like a little guest sleeping loft that's under height. So something like you'd see in a tiny house, but that's the kind of thing that we're looking at in 490 square feet. And ironically, his lot is super tiny. It's one of the smallest lots we've ever worked on, but even observing the setbacks required from property lines, um, you know, it's very easy to actually conceptualize putting three of these. I mean, we'd probably want to change uh, glazing and, and massing without just plopping them down side by side, but it's super easy to throw three of these units down on a tiny lot in Vancouver. So if we were to incorporate architectural ideas like what is being proposed in San Jose, like having party walls on a smaller lot like this, um, I think it's a really powerful idea and, and there's, there's quite a bit there from a feasibility standpoint, so. Ron, um, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, we can't see the floor plan right now. I think the screen share is still up on the Smallworks website. Would it be possible to switch that over? All of that? <laughs> there we go. There we go. Sorry about that. So I'll just back up. I feel like after this whole pandemic, I feel like somehow I'm actually getting worse at Zoom. <laughs> so this is, this is the little house that we're working on. Um, so it's just a little 490 square foot cottage. Um, like I said, just enough with his living room, um, the bedroom with a little work area, a bathroom that miraculously somehow I squeezed a sauna into. Um, and then like his, his like super efficient little kitchen. So that's what we would kind of consider the concept of just enough. And, and this, this is one of the smaller homes that we've taken part in. Um, <clears throat> looking back at the massing now, 
and, and seeing what kind of throwing three of these on one lot with having to make some sort of, this is a corner lot, so there, there's ample, ample opportunity for parking right outside, but just kind of throwing these close together without taking into consider like a, in the consideration a party wall, which would obviously make this design so much more efficient, but it's, it's totally doable to, you know, kind of put three independent dwellings on, on a tiny lot. So doing something like what's being proposed with that in, in San Jose is, is I think it's a really powerful initiative. So. Thanks, Robbie. That, yeah, that was that was really cool to see. You know, the actual spatial, you know, the rendering, and yeah, what that actually tangibly looks like. Um, and Tamara, I think you will close us out, and then we'll move into some some questions. Sounds good. Let me throw my slides up. All right. Um, so thanks so much, Michael, for really outlining the the, the clear benefit environmental benefits of uh, small housing. And then Robbie for um, showing us how high quality design and how interesting and unique and you know well suited they can really be for each individual homeowner. Um, so my name is Tamara and um, I'm here representing Small Housing BC. Um, as was mentioned, we champion small housing forms in communities across British Columbia. We do capacity building, we do advocacy research, we provide um, technical support for municipal partners. And um, we also generate ideas for creative solutions to our housing affordability crisis. And that's what I'm here to talk uh, with you about today. So I'm presenting on our permanently affordable home ownership model, um, which can be achieved through community-based infill homes. Now, um, this was a model that was developed initially as a feasibility study within the city of Vancouver back in 2019. Um, as a way to ensure that we can have dedicated affordability um, while we uh, open up our neighborhoods um, for additional densification. Um, so through this model, essentially we're looking at on one single family lot um, through by allowing a bonus density, so additional units, uh, and allowing them to also be strata titled, so they can be held in ownership, um, plus some creative architectural and site design we're able to yield four to six homes uh, with a mix of attainable market ownership and affordable below market ownership. Um, so the next two slides just show some uh, lot layouts uh, using uh, typical lots, um, lot dimensions from the city of Vancouver. And on both of these, we're able to achieve uh, five units of housing. This first one has a, a larger house flex near the front of the property with four units. Um, and then in the back, we have a carriage house with an additional unit. All of these units um, are two and three bedrooms, and they range from 800 to 1,200 square feet, so a pretty decent size for a small household. And then on this next design, uh, we have a larger home up front with row houses behind and a laneway house in the back, uh, once again yielding five units, at least one of which would be held um, for permanent uh, affordability. Um, so just, just so that we're all on the same page about all of the great benefits of gentle density or community-based infill homes, um, they're, they're smaller and more affordable by design. They can bring housing choice into more neighborhoods. Um, they can be developed by local homeowners uh, who can partner with a local builder or a small-scale developer. Um, they're in high demand by seniors. Um, who want to age in place by young families who want to foot into the uh, into the ownership market and by local service professionals who are already working in our communities, um, but might be um, having long commutes. And uh, we know that they can also be built without stressing city infrastructure, um, just by virtue of being only incremental growth and uh, by being dispersed throughout the city. Um, they're also fiscally smart for our local governments. And um, as was really well articulated by Michael already, they can help us to meet our climate targets. So in, in our estimation, our greater region is really in this early adoption stage where innovation has happened. And we know that the financial models work, we know that the physical models work and that we can get great 
character consistent design and really high quality um, design and, and great homes out of this. So it's just a matter of pushing through these next steps so that we can really uh, amplify the, the uptake. So in addition to um, those benefits to any kind of gentle density initiative, the key benefits that are specific to our um, permanent affordability model is that private land and capital is able to be leveraged in order to build attainable and permanently affordable housing. So that means that no government subsidies are actually required. Um, we're using private land and capital. But if the government does want to step in um, with additional subsidy or by contributing land, we can definitely achieve even deeper levels of affordability or can ensure that more of the units on each individual lot will be uh, dedicated towards the um, uh, towards the um, the, the dedicated affordability um, model. Um, Community-based growth of housing supply. So essentially through this model, um, we're incentivizing local property owners to redevelop, but the financial yields are, the, 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 there's lower returns such that commercial developers won't find it all that attractive and we're able to protect the land markets um, from speculation. Um, also, in comparison with other uh, programs that are supporting missing middle housing, um, this model, uh, due to it being ownership based, really has minimal administration for non market units. You can use existing real estate tools and existing real estate uh, professional capacity in order to achieve this without creating some sort of cumbersome large government program. Um, and it's essentially held as a, a scattered site housing trust. Um, and we know as well that um, there can be really rapid supply creation through the use of this model. Um, all of the construction crews that are out there working on one for one replacement of, of homes in single family neighborhoods, you can rededicate that, uh, that workforce and have fairly short building cycles um, to really be able to promote this uh, supply creation. Um, so that wraps up my uh, my presentation on our permanently affordable home ownership model. And uh, as I may have mentioned earlier, uh, this was originally created as a feasibility study for the city of Vancouver. Um, we're currently also in conversations with the province to see if it's possible um, to refine this and actually roll it out on a province wide basis. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much to all our panelists. Uh, I think we can now move, open it up a bit for, for questions. So just a quick reminder to all of our participants, feel free to use the Q&A function to type any questions that you may have. Uh, I have, you know, <laughs> or don't, because I have tons of questions of my own. I could spend hours talking to you, to you all. Um, I think my first one that I'll throw out to, I think, Robbie or Tamara, you know, you, you've all done, you've clearly done extensive work around ADUs and infill housing. What's your experience been with proposals like opportunity housing, you know, legalizing this gentle density? You know, what have your clients and neighbors said about the adding of new units like ADUs and duplexes? So, you know, whether it's neighborhood character or the sustainability benefits, like what, what's just been the, how, what have people said about, about things like this? Um, I, I can answer that. It's funny. It's, it's really, it's, it's quite different in a case by case basis, but one of our clients recently wrote a piece that's a four a four part piece for the Globe and Mail, which is like a pretty large periodical in Canada. Um, and it was just about the struggles that she underwent doing something a little bit outside the box, which was building about it's like about a 1200 square foot multi generational home behind their heritage home. And so it was quite a long and arduous process. And so from a municipal government standpoint, we faced some pretty significant challenges because, you know, the organization of the municipal government changed drastically in, in the time that it takes to get these projects through. So sometimes, sometimes the political winds can change faster than the planning department can account for. And so we did see like, you know, we're playing the game and the rules are changing while we're playing. Um, in that case, they wanted a 16 foot side yard when we were mid process, which was, you know, we didn't have. Um, so, you know, the, the overarching feedback 
that if I look at my kind of 10 year career in this space, we have had people who vocally opposed to this at, in the early days become clients kind of like eight years later, um, which I think is like the, regardless of what someone's knee jerk reaction is to this kind of gentle density, um, it is being fully adopted here in Vancouver, um, kind of come hell or high water. Another interesting thing is I've actually had feedback. This is kind of, a I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but I used to live when I was in university in this neighborhood that has a really famous Jamaican patty shop that, that it's in the middle of a residential neighborhood and it was going to go out of business because in Vancouver at that time, there was tons of vacant homes. Um, and then we had the opportunity of building in that same lane. And I kind of went to the Jamaican patty shop and was surprised to see that it was still open. And they told me that it's basically because of laneway homes, putting so many more families into the mix on, on the West side that they've, you know, we're seeing a change in small businesses, um, which Michael was talking about walk score and things like that. Like, you know, it, that that's really unique for Vancouver having um, businesses in residential neighborhoods. So to see them flourish because of this, um, there's obvious kind of larger aggregate community benefits to this gentle density. So people are coming around mm -hmm. is the headline of that ambling speech. Anything to add tomorrow or Michael? Yeah, I think, I mean, common concerns, uh, historic preservation, parking, neighborhood character, I think those are common, you know, across North America um, and dealt with in different ways. And I think that just the more positive examples we have of really well-designed um, structures that are um, character consistent and respect sort of the pattern of the neighborhood. Um, and as demonstrated um, through uh, at least one of the infill configurations that I, I showed on my slide, you can have at this at the street front, uh, what just looks like a standard house and somebody walking down the street would never know <laughs> that behind it, um, you know, there's several row houses and a laneway house, and you can have this little pocket community built in there without really um, disturbing what some people would consider the, the character of the neighborhood. I think as well, um, we're starting to recognize um, that neighborhood character is something that's so subjective and that we don't really, you know, have good standards around. And, and I really invite people whenever they bring up this question of neighborhood character um, to think about the neighborhood characters and isn't it really the people who make up the place that that give the community and give the neighborhood um, the qualities that we really enjoy and that make it feel like home and make it feel uh, vibrant and vital um, so yeah lots of learnings here in Vancouver <laughs> yeah yeah this is fascinating stuff um, Michael anything to add yeah, I would just agree. I think that the character of my city, Portland, has changed quite a lot since the rents have gone up 50%. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, and I've got actually a question for, for you, Michael. Um, I know that, you know, I know that you were obviously very involved in, in Oregon, and I know the politics of the recent fourplex legalizations, you know, this was largely led by environmental organizations. You know, do you have any insight or do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, I can talk a little bit. Uh, the uh, it was kind of I think unexpected that that was where the the leadership came around. But there's a group in Oregon, Thousand Friends of Oregon, is an anti sprawl organization. It was founded in the '70s when we created our anti sprawl statewide sort of land use regulation. Uh, and basically, their mission is to prevent sprawl when possible, and also prevent that from leading to economic catastrophe. So uh, we, the, if, if we prevent sprawl, as BC actually did a few years before we did, um, we also need to ensure that we are imposing like some standards on cities to make sure that they are allowing more housing to exist within their boundaries, as we did, by the way, 100 years ago, when all the cities on the West Coast saw a huge wave of in, immigration and uh, migration and were able to deal with it and in fact emerged as like this immense center of the world economy at that point because we were allowed to create new homes. We weren't involved in this dog eat dog battle for the few homes that existed. 
Uh, so I would take a, yeah, maybe a more radical perspective that we built these wonderful cities uh, without a ton of uh, micromanaging of what buildings looked like or whatever. And I think that we've been the better for it. Yeah, that's, that's really cool to see how, you know, environmental organizations took, took the lead on that. Um, oh, sorry. We'll yeah, some... I got distracted there. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> anyway, no. Yeah, that's, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, that, no, that, that, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm going to start moving to some of the audience Q&A now. So the first question we have, uh, one is from Remy. And she says, great presentation all. So, so props from, from an audience member. And then the question is, if we increase density in single family neighborhoods uh, five or six times, you know, if you put a five, five or six units where there's just one before, is there enough density to sustain frequent public transit so that new residents are not car dependent? And at, Michael, I think you touched on this where, you know, this is something that we all kind of presuppose where it's like, oh, we need to make sure we have the infrastructure to support it. But I think you've you kind of touched on that saying that transit isn't is important, but maybe not as important as we need it and will grow in uh, viability with more density. Yeah, I know. So in Portland, the um, ratio that I've heard Jarrett Walker, who's used to be based in Vancouver, is a local transit consultant here, uh, does work around the world. Uh, he sort of has a rule of thumb that uh, whatever, I forget what the exact full dwelling units per acre is, but it's essentially double what the sort of five thousand one home per 5,000 square foot ratio gets to. So whatever, if you got two homes per 5,000 square feet of buildable land, then that's the ratio at which like a frequent service bus becomes economically viable for a lot of transit agencies. That's where it sort of starts to make sense to have a bus more than once every 12 minutes or so. So, um, uh, that's obviously takes time to get to, but yeah, there's a back and forth and you need to have buses within walking distance to reduce car ownership. And you need to have lots of homes within walking distance of a bus stop to increase the quality of the other options. Great. Uh, another question, this one for Robbie. In your work, do you often have conversations with homeowners about affordable housing or the potential of their project to serve as an affordable housing option? Or do most homeowners have plans for who they want to rent to or what they would want to use the units for? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know how you want to look at it, but um, I would say that right now in our client list, and I think it's because of how cute our houses are, <laughs> about 70 to 75% of our current client roster is either kids kids my age building in mom and dad's backyard or or mom and dad building to be closer to the grandkids that is so much of what we do um so it's like very few of our homes are built for rental and the ones that we do build for rental what we usually see and we actually like to see it is a lot of our clients kind of get the idea that maybe they'll move into it someday. And so it's kind of built in terms of layout, maybe not like what you would build if you were gonna just build a, a rental unit. But the reason why this is kind of close to my heart personally is a lot of those jobs that we don't win because I think people feel that maybe our homes are a bit too overwrought for just like, oh, I'm just like, I do talk to people all the time and I never hear from them again. Um, but, but people who say like, I don't really care what's back there. It's just like a rental, you know, it's like, that's, I actually loathe that approach to uh, purpose-built rental. The fact that it's, who cares? It's not for anyone because someone does have to live there. And so that I would say that most of the stuff that is being built that we're not winning in Vancouver is um, as someone who lives and breathes this housing format all the time. I like get physically sick when I see some of the ones that get built. Like we're talking like a 600 square foot laneway house with a 200 square foot garage on the main floor that the main house uses to park their car and that is literally the situation with a family that lives in the same lane as us. And we've got kids the same age. And so we see them. And before COVID, you know, we had dinner at each other's houses and their kind of purpose-built rental is like, so I don't know. I, I like the idea. Like these are, these are really important 
um, homes that are being built in terms of like providing rental housing for for Vancouverites. Um, I just wish that I think there should be a shotgun clause at the city where if you build one of these, the city can say, ha, you have to live in it. And I feel like we would see like a lot nicer homes. Um, and they don't even, it doesn't, there's, there's an example on our website I urge everyone to look at and it's the perfect rental house because our homeowners, I knew that they were never gonna live in this house. Just like you spend 10 minutes with them and they're never gonna move into a 750 square foot home. But they kind of clung to this idea that someday they might. And so the finishes are extremely, extremely understated. Like they weren't trying to spend a boatload of money and it has no effect on the price of construction, but the layout, you can just tell there's quite a bit of like love in the layout. Like it's a very cool, interesting space. And I, so I think there is overlap in that Venn diagram of something that's gonna be an interesting place for someone to live and, and minimizing cost. And I just don't think we found a good way to like hit the bullseye on that. And I would love to, so. Mm -hmm. Long answer. Uh, then, no, that, yeah, that's, that's really insightful. And that's, yeah, I, I like that anecdote. Uh, and I like the idea of a shotgun clause. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, if you're building, you better be willing to, to live in it to, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm getting, I'm seeing some more questions coming in from chat. Uh, someone would just like to know, you know, they wanna hear more about the sustainability, you know, what are, are there any specific design characteristics that are enabled by Plex housing that are, you know, that payoff that's unique to Plex housing, um, you know, is there a new tech or shared infrastructure? You know, what are what are some real sustainability sustainability benefits that you see uh, coming coming out of Plex Housing? And I think this is anyone that wants to take it. Michael, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a technical uh, expert on the construction, so that's all you. Yeah, nor am I. <laughs> <laughs> well. It looks like we don't have, yeah, maybe we then we can move to another question if no one is chomping at the bit to, to get to that one. Mm -hmm. um, this one, this one's nice and easy. Some, we have someone that's asking if panelists would feel comfortable providing emails to stay in touch about future uh, unique ideas. Um, yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up. So I think we will find a way to, to get that out to the people that have attended. Um, another question on Plex Density. Specifically, why does this not impact uh, existing infrastructure? Uh, you know, is there is there any way we could go more into depth on you know maybe the efficiencies that that we see when we implement this plex housing um, in the way that it doesn't stress our infrastructure as much as one might expect? Sure, I can speak to that piece. Um, I, yeah, I think that just because it's an incremental increase on a single site, as opposed to sort of a mid rise or a high rise, and cl clearly there's a lot more impact on a, a single area. So with that dispersed um, density, you can allow for uh, additional load within your infrastructure network before having to do major upgrades. And then also relative to sprawl development, where there would clearly be uh, a lot more uh, requirement of extension of city infrastructure to farther off locations, um, the compact uh, form uh, allows for, for, for lesser impact on, um, on the infrastructural requirements. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, I, I definitely think it does. Does anyone, Robbie or Michael, anything you want to add? I would say if you think that uh, infill in the city has a lot of infrastructure costs. You should see infill in the boonies. It has <laughs> colossal infrastructure costs, and like we are all paying for some of those in the form of environmental damage, in form of our literal spending on like how much we pay for everything in the form of taxes and so on. So, yeah, it, it is yeah. more efficient in the end to build closer to other people than away from other people. Ultimately, those costs are going to come home eventually. Yeah. Um, a quick question from someone from from Joe. Are foreign investors? I think this this is a quick one. I don't know if any of you are experts on this, but I figured I'd throw it out there. Are foreign investors one of the causes of high housing costs in Vancouver? I think this is very speculative, but up to one third of sales are to Chinese nationals. Question mark. Um, does anyone know that off the top of their head, or is able it's, to address that? I don't know if it's like I don't know about the data of like one third of sales to Chinese nationals, but I know that foreign investment 
not specifically Chinese people, but foreign investment is is a huge concern in Vancouver. But there's there's new government taxes like that people are having to pay right away. Uh, two two actually that affect there's like a foreign investment um, tax that is applied to real estate transactions and that has actually that resulted in cooling the market prior to COVID big time um, and there's also a, an empty homes tax now as well because the the bigger problem was that people from outside of Canada were buying homes and then not living in them because they were just basically parking money there that they didn't want their government to get a hold of and so that's fine guys but like we've we do need to live in the houses that are in Vancouver. And so the empty homes tax had a huge effect on that. We saw lots of people wanting to, you know, use the homes that they owned. So. Yeah, that's, that's good to know. And uh, I think, yeah, I'll, I'll move to the next question. Uh, yeah. This one's for Tamara. In many studies, access to capital and financing options are major barriers for homeowners, especially lower income homeowners. Uh, is there a plan to incentivize homeowners to redevelop and incur the co the whole cost of a project? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, because certainly there are um, homeowners who might not have the ability to raise the capital to be able to redevelop their sites for five or six units, um, as was articulated through this permanently affordable homeownership model. Um, so as the model is based thus far, it's, uh, there are no, uh, there is no additional layer of government subsidy or access to low cost financing. However, um, our provincial government has um, recently released some new uh, programs to support affordable home ownership that, that, do, that does allow access to low cost financing and development streamlining and some other pieces. So there would be the possibility to um, potentially dovetail uh, our model with an existing government program to make sure that the capital is available to, to get these projects rolling. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, a question from Michael. Uh, probably not Michael Anderson, unless you're also, you know, in, unless you're also an attendee. <laughs> so should we try to improve the quality and safety of our public transit before expecting to people to use it more often, or will safety naturally improve due to the added ridership from the denser neighborhoods? So I don't know if this is necessarily within any of your, uh, you know, areas of expertise, but do you have any insights on this? It's kind of like a, um, what came first? the chicken or the egg, right? Um, I'm gonna answer your question in a really roundabout way. And that is in Vancouver, we have, we have unprecedented kind of issues surrounding petty crime and homelessness and, and drug use. And the lanes are kind of like a, kind of a hotspot for that kind of activity. And it's a, something that I, I deal with quite a bit um, on the client side, people are, are worried about living in, in the back alleys. And how this relates to transit is, what we find is that as soon as you start building a house in the back lane that has like motion sensors and like a front door and like windows that face the lane, it quickly becomes a lane that people don't like wanna do crime in. So like we kind of brighten up the lane. And I think the same kind of principle applies to densification is that as soon as there are a lot of people moving in and about, it's going to become apparent that, well, A, there'll be more people riding on public transit. And I think they'll inherently become safer because you're going to see like a mom with three kids in fluorescent orange rain jackets, like on the bus. And it just, I think it just changes the vibe a little bit. Um, and I think you'll also like, so with an increase in ridership, it also increases in infrastructure kind of in a correlative manner. And that's just very anecdotal and you can ignore that because I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's a, that's a great point. Another question that we have in, uh, from the audience is from Linda. Uh, what are some of the best strategies to win over community and elected leaders and single family neighborhood residents and in Vancouver and Portland to for small and multiplex homes? Um, Michael, I think you definitely have some experience with that and, and Tamara and Robbie as well. 
before tomorrow? I'll tell, I don't want to say stuff too, but. Yeah, no, I think that that's a really great question um, and clearly one that we need to be uh, addressing better and with more consistent language um, as we we move towards pushing our uh, affordability model into hopefully a more um, provincial scope. So I think it's really about just making it relatable. It's not scary that this isn't really a big change. You won't even really notice that much difference from, you know, just walking down the street. There, there, uh, there's, yeah, the, the, our, the, the design um, is there. We, we know that we can do it without having really imposing buildings. You'll barely be able to tell that there's this incremental increase. Plus, with the rate of change, um, it's not like there's going to be a blanket <laughs> of fourplexes that are just immediately going to be installed into a community. It will be incremental over time. And so I think it's really important to underscore the benefits to um, like local property owners and the voting population, including their personal stories of how it can benefit them to have their grandkids nearby, to allow them to downsize and age in place, age in community. Um, for those who have uh, adult children with developmental disabilities and would like for them to be able to be semi-independent but be nearby, there's so many stories about, you know, people really directly um, benefiting uh, from, from the, these types of projects, as well as being able to support a local walkable corner store coffee shop. Um, so I think it's a great angle to remind people, like, do you want to be able to like walk down the block to a coffee shop and have like a, a community meeting place? Um, well, in order to do so, you need a certain um, density of population to be able to support that kind of commerce. Uh, and then lastly, I think that we need to um, speak to like highlighting the stories of those others who will um, benefit directly, uh, who aren't currently living in the neighborhood, who aren't current um, property owners, but who are the local service professionals, who are the essential workers, they're the firemen, they're teachers, they're our librarians. They, these are the people who make up our community and, and they've been serving our community for years. They also deserve a right to be living in the community and they will absolutely undoubtedly be adding to neighborhood vibrancy and vitality. That is really well said. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to pop a link in the chat about a link to an article that I co-wrote about sort of messages that seem to work on help, helping talk about this stuff. And um, I, I'm obsessed with this question and would love to talk to anybody about it by email or whatever. But um, a couple things, I totally want to echo the like, where will you and your kids personally live in the future question. Um, and uh, so, uh, and, and then one of the key um, compromises that we struck here in Portland uh, around this stuff was we said, uh, you remember those, those giant one plexes I showed the slide of earlier, we said, those are gonna have to get smaller. We're gonna set a maximum size per structure. And that size is gonna be smallest for one plexes and a little bit extra large size for duplexes, a little bit extra size for triplexes, but it's all gonna be smaller than the previous maximum size. and that though I don't think, I think that one of the economic effects of that that we found was it actually pushed some of the redevelopment into lower income neighborhoods, which I think is bad. But one mm -hmm. of the benefits for the people who were saying no to the housing was that it sort of peeled off the people who were opposed to large buildings. And the only people who were left opposing it were the people who were opposed to people. And people who were opposed to people are not particularly numerous or sympathetic. Um, so that was a part of the political wrangling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tamara and Michael. Uh, Robbie, any any thoughts? You know, I know you're very client facing. You work a lot with the homeowners themselves, and you know, get a lot of that face to face experience. So, like ways of infiltrating. Uh. <laughs> so that sounds very. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I honestly, my my experience has been, it takes a whole lot more energy to promote the idea of nimbyism, which is like not in my backyard mentality, than it does to actually um, bring an exciting new idea like this into neighborhoods. There's, there's a couple holdout neighborhoods in Vancouver that, that uh, aren't thrilled about the idea of laneway housing, but we've, we've been building there recently. 
And, and again, that was kind of the people I talked about at the beginning of the call where um, people who were vocally opposed to this are now coming on side. And it's, it's literally in answer to the question, well, where are my kids gonna live? And, you know, we've got kids who are, you know, a little younger than me, but if they're kind of having their first kids and so grandkids are now in, in the mix and it, it's just kind of bringing it home for a lot of people in Vancouver. Um, we did have one guy who built a house on West 37th, which is traditionally like a very no laneway house neighborhood. And um, quite a, like, I love the guy, but he's a bit of a grump. And he called me and said, we're going to paint the house pink. And it was like, we were under construction. So, and it was because his neighbors were giving him flack about building a laneway house. So <laughs> we built him a pink, it's on our house's West 37th laneway house, but the, we, we built a a pink laneway house on the corner in kind of the heart of the last stronghold of nimbyism in vancouver so i think it's dead here <laughs> yeah safe to say it's a thing of the past and it, it, it just takes more energy to kind of stay negative about it i think mm -hmm. it does to slowly come on side so yeah yeah thanks so much for the for the great answers there um i think we're getting some more engagement in the chat but you know it is full 55, so I want to be you know respectful of everyone's time and just again a huge huge thanks to our panelists for joining us today. Um, if our panelists would like to drop their emails in the chat, uh, that would I think for for people that want to connect with them, we can also provide that uh, afterwards in an email as well if that is okay with everyone. And so just a quick note, this talk was recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. So you can share it far and wide because I'm sure you all had many, many friends that wanted to attend, uh, but may not have been able to. So feel free to, to check that, check out the recording. And finally, just a, a quick plug for Green Belts. The, the work that we do to protect the Bay Area's natural and working lands while also creating thriving communities is made possible by you. So please donate today, which you could do securely on our website at greenbelt.org slash donate. And if you'd like to learn more about Greenbelt Alliance, please check out our website, greenbelt.org. So that is, you know, that's that's basically it. Um, thanks again to all, of our, to all of our panelists, Robbie, Michael, Tamara. This has been, it's been an absolute pleasure being able to talk with to you today. And I know all of our attendees learned a lot, myself included.